Hello everyone, in this episode I'm going to talk about tit-for-tat strategies in the context of uh, Infinite Horizon Repeated Prison as Dilemma, and I'm going to show that those strategies do not form subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Uh, well, what is tit-for-tat strategy? Uh, simple, uh, for each player, uh, he basically chooses the action at every period, he chooses the action that his opponent took in the previous period. Uh, that's it. So it's simple in the sense that players do not have to worry about how their opponents are going to play uh, in the current moment, uh, as long as they observe what their opponents did in the previous period, they're just going to replicate this. Uh, in the context of Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, the uh, tit-for-tat strategies make sense because uh, it includes the idea of retaliation. Remember, in the Prisoner's Dilemma, there are two actions, cooperate or defect. So if we both cooperate, that's beautiful, we just play nice, and we, we do nice, or we be nice uh, to each other. However, if somebody deviates, that means my opponent is being jerked to me, and so uh, uh, tit for tat strategy says retaliate this uh, behavior, meaning if you were a jerk to me, I'm going to be a jerk to you in the next period. Another niceness of tit for tat strategies uh, is, is that unlike uh, green trigger strategies, uh, the punishment does not have to last. Uh, for infinite horizon. Remember in the Grim Trigger strategies we cooperate and if somebody deviates, well then we're going to play defect for the rest of the game. Tick for tat strategies also include the idea of forgiveness, right? Uh, the Grim Trigger strategies, well punish forever is like, uh, well you're stuck in the hell uh, forever. But the tit for tat strategies basically says I'm gonna punish you once uh, but then if you be nice, I'll be nice. So it's like there's this idea of forgiveness. So, However, uh, they're not subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, which is a problematic uh, because in an extensive form game, in fact, in, a, in, in an infinite horizon repeated game, almost, almost everything is uh, code and code. Uh, is subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, and so those nice intuitive tit for tat strategies are not subgame perfect Nash. So this is exactly what we're going to show in this episode. First thing first, let me just uh, as formal as possible uh, state the uh, strategy profile. So I'm assuming that. Uh, both, oh, by the way, the tit for tat strategies make sense when there are two players in the game, right? Because remember, I'm going to choose the action that my opponent took in the previous period. If I have uh, more than one opponent, which one of those actions I'm going to take? Um, so, therefore, uh, again, uh, yes, I am solving uh, the Infinite Horizon Prisoner's Dilemma game, but you can apply this idea to any uh, uh, Infinite Horizon repeated game uh, with two players. So, here is the strategy profile. I assume both players play tit for tat strategy. At t equals zero, they start playing cc. So both players are going to choose cooperate. Then for the rest of the periods, uh, by the way, uh, because of this discount factor, uh, we start t from zero, but this is the first period, all right? And then uh, for all t greater than zero, each player is going to choose the action his opponent took in the previous period, right? Well, so let's denote this S1, S2. And the question is, is this subgame perfect Nash equilibrium for a uh, sufficiently high discount factor delta when the, patient, uh, the players are patient? I assume that both players use exactly the same discount factor. And because the game is symmetric, the uh, discount factor is the same. The strategy is symmetric because they start from CC. So therefore I can conclude that, you know, the, this, this game is symmetric. So therefore I don't really have to do the analysis uh, for each player separately. I just do it for one player. Oh, That's oh, it. Yeah. Subgame perfect Nash equilibrium means at every subgame, the continuation strategies form a Nash equilibrium. All right, well, how do we show this? Well, first off, in this game, there are infinitely many possible subgames, right? 
uh, so does that mean that I have to analyze all those subgames and see the continuation strategies of the tit for tat strategies form in Nash equilibrium in every single one of them? Well, this is an impossible task. Well, luckily, uh, we don't really have to do this infinitely many times because we can categorize those subgames. How so? This is exactly what I'm going to do, but let me first uh, make some observations. Well, whether they play tit for tat strategies or not, in this game, in an infinite horizon repeated game, players are going to choose some actions, right? C, 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 D, 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 whatever. So they're going to play, and let's say uh, in period T, uh, both players can observe what happened in the past, and we call it history. It makes sense, right? Because it's the history. We are now in the period T. Uh, whatever happened, happened. We can't change it, but we can change the future. So the play after period T may depend on the history, right? It makes sense because, for example, if my opponent have been very nice to me in 100 periods, well then, next period being nice to me sounds like a good idea. However, if he has been jerk to me for like 100 periods, being nice to him doesn't really sound like a good idea, right? So my strategies may depend on the history. And in fact, the tit for tat strategies are history dependent. Uh, however, that's a very important observation that you should clear is that uh, for the tit for tat strategies, the entire history is not important. What matters is exactly what happened right before the current period. So this is period T minus one. If I am as a player making decision in period T, all I care is what happened in period T minus one. That's all I care. Whether previously, I mean, I'm sorry, at the beginning of the game, whether we started with CC or with something else, I don't know, I don't care. According to those strategies, all I'm gonna look is what my opponent has played, okay? So, for that reason, I can categorize the histories and therefore I can categorize the subgames. All right, well, how many potential uh, 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 history groups I can form? Well, remember, all it matters is the last period uh, outcome. Well, remember, the period outcome is either CC or CD or DC or DD. There's no other possible outcome in this game because each player has two actions. And so therefore, there's going to be two times two, four outcomes. So that means in period T minus one, there can be for possible outcomes. What are they? Well, CC, meaning I played C, let's say I am player one, you played C, I played C, but you played D, um, DC, and then finally DD. Agree? So then this is basically one uh, family of subgame. This is another family of subgame. This is a, the third family of subgame, and so on. So there are four families of subgames that I need to uh, analyze. So I don't really have to analyze infinitely many subgames, but there are four groups of subgames. And the thing is, uh, the continuation strategies within these uh, uh, subgames are going to be the same because all of them start with period T minus one, all right? Uh, I, we observed CC. So therefore in period T, I'm going to play C, you're going to play C, all right? Uh, here we observed CD. That means, uh, remember, we are playing a tit for tat strategy. So I play what you did and you play what I did. In, in period T. Well, here I'm going to play D, you're going to play C. Here, the opposite, I'm going to play C, you're going to play D. And here we're going to play D, D. And then whatever happens, happens afterwards. So therefore, all I have to show is that the tit for tat strategies, this is the continuation strategy, 
are in this subgame. This is the continuation strategy in the subgames where in period, you know, in the previous period, CD observed. And this is another continuation strategy. These are all uh, uh, outcome, potential outcomes of the same strategy, tit for tat. All right? Uh, they are different outcomes simply because their histories are different. Okay? Well, so what am I supposed to do? Well, in every subgame, I need to show that tit for tat strategy is a Nash equilibrium here, a Nash equilibrium here, a Nash equilibrium here, a Nash equilibrium here. All right, so let's do this analysis for uh, the first group. So in T, in T minus one, we played this. So remember the Nash equilibrium says the following. Player one's uh, utility of playing, uh, uh, so S1, uh, uh, S2 is, is greater than or equal to player one's utility S1 prime S2, All right? And this must be true for every S1 prime in S1. Well, this is uh, what we need to do. It's like, I have to compare, uh, so this is what I call no deviation payoff and this is a deviation payoff what does that mean that means given that my opponent is going to play his tit for tat strategies in this continuation game well playing tit for tat strategies in this continuation game uh, this is my payoff well this payoff should be greater than or equal to any payoff i can get given that my opponent uh, is still playing tit for tat strategy, but I play something else. All right, and so this is for any S1 prime strategy which is available in the subgame. And we, trust me, there are infinitely many uh, available strategies here. Uh, but the thing is, remember, I have to do all this also for those subgames. So, what is the difference? Well, here S1 says start with playing C and then. Uh, continue with C. However, when it comes to this uh, 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 subgame analysis, here the strategy S1 is going to be play D in period T and then play C because your opponent is going to be playing C and so on and so forth. Okay? So, but generically, this is how we uh, denote uh, the comparison. Well, what I would like to say is the following. Look, all I need to do compared to payoffs, uh, the one with no deviation payoff, the one with deviation payoff, but the problem is there are infinitely many possible deviations. So do I have to make infinitely many possible comparisons? Well, at this moment, uh, one deviation property kicks in. Uh, and thanks to that property or uh, uh, one deviation uh, proposition theorem, it says we don't really have to worry about all possible deviations. All we have to worry about is just one single deviation, which is happening at period T. Uh, it's going to come clearer. So let's start the analysis. So I'm going to use a notation. Oh, by the way, I have to do, I am going to do everything for player one only, again, uh, because the game is symmetric. So here is the payoff, no deviation payoff. Uh, I'm going to use a sort of a notation, which is uh, uh, new to you, maybe. Uh, don't take it too literally. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I summarize a lot of words into notation, okay? So, I mean, it helps to me. Uh, so here is the uh, 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 payoff. I play cooperate, and then I stick to my tit for tat strategy. Well, you always play your tit for tat strategy. Okay, so this is no deviation payoff. No deviation payoff. All right, well, now my deviation payoff. Instead of playing C, right? I mean, in period, this is period T. 
And this is rest of the game, rest of the game. Well, in period T, instead of playing C, uh, well, there's only one other option, which is playing D. And then I stick to S1, the tick for tat strategy, and then S2. Again, so S1 represents the idea of tit for tat. After I play D, S1, S2 is going to give me a bunch of different outcomes. After playing C, S1 and S2 are going to give me a bunch of different outcomes. So therefore, this S1 and this S1, outcome-wise, they're not going to give me the same thing. All right, so don't forget, S1 is a function of what I did today. And, and same S2 is a function of what I... So the outcome that S2 is going to generate is a function of what I do today. All right, so again, as I said, these are notations that I just invent for the sake of making a longer argument shorter. The longer argument is what I'm telling you. In period T, I'm going to play D, and for the rest of the game, I'm going to stick to my tit-for-tat strategy. And you will always stick to your tit-for-tat strategy, okay? Well, as I said, this is the only deviation you need to worry about, deviation. Why? As I said, uh, one deviation property. It says, uh, let just players deviate in their current period and then stick to their strategies for the rest of the game and make this comparison. That's enough to show that a strategy profile is an, and do this for every sub game. Uh, it's enough to prove that those strategy profiles is the uh, uh, sub game perfect Nash equilibrium. Okay. However, that's very important. Making this comparison uh, is not enough for Nash equilibrium. Because one deviation property is for subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. It's not for Nash equilibrium. Okay? Uh, which means uh, showing Nash equilibrium in infinite horizon repeated games sometimes much harder, could be much harder than showing uh, subgame perfection. All right. So let's calculate those payoffs. Uh, I play C today in period T, I mean. And then you stick to your tit for tat strategy, which means you play C. Oh, by the way, remember uh, the previous period we both played CC. So therefore, you're going to play C. I'm, go I'm playing C. So therefore, I'm going to get two uh, payoff. Uh, I'm not going to put the discounts yet. Plus, next period, uh, well, remember I, we played CC. What's going to happen the next period? Another CC, right? So it's another two. Uh, let's leave some space because I'm going to put the discount factors. Plus, well, this is also CC. So therefore, I will, we will basically keep getting two and two and two. Uh, well, now let's talk about the discount factor. Well, if this was a period zero, I would just multiply this by delta, delta one, delta two, and so on. But this is period t. So should I make this delta to the power t, t plus one, t plus two? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Why is that? Well, because if I do this delta to the power t, delta t plus one, delta t plus two, I will do the same thing here, delta t, delta t plus one, delta t plus 2, etc. And so when I take this guy into delta to the power t parentheses, same here, those delta to the t powers will cancel each out. So all I will get is 1, delta, delta square, and so on. So whether we start from t equals, uh, I'm sorry, time equals 0 or t minus 1, doesn't matter. Okay? You can just, for simplicity, Multiply this by delta to the power zero. Uh, this is delta to the power one, delta to the power two, etc. So if you do this calculation, this is simple. In the two parentheses, this is one plus delta plus delta square plus. So this is a geometric series. I know that it's equal to one divided by one minus delta. So therefore, if I don't deviate, my payoff is going to be two divided by one minus delta. All right. What about this guy? I deviate, but remember, previously we played CC, so my opponent is going to play C, but I will be playing D. So DC is the outcome, I'm going to get 3. 
Well, but because I played D and my opponent played C, for the rest of the game, we're going to stick to the uh, tit for tat strategy. So that means uh, we're going to play CD and then DC and then CD. All right. So we basically be uh, going back and forth between these. Well, so I have three, but when it's CD, I'm going to get zero delta and then another DC, three delta square and then zero delta cube and so on. So if you uh, ignore the zero terms and take into three parentheses, this is going to be one plus delta square plus delta to the power four plus delta to the power six and so on. So this is not really a geometric series. Uh, do you know the formula for this? You don't really have to. Uh, you can just calculate it. All right. Uh, how so? Uh, well, let me do it here. I know uh, that 1 plus delta plus delta square plus delta cube plus delta to the power 4 plus delta. I don't know why I need that many. Uh, plus infinity. This is 1 divided by 1 minus delta, right? So I'm going to separate this into two groups. Uh, 1 plus the odd number, guys, delta 6, and then the, I'm sorry, the even number, guys, and then the odd number, guys, plus delta uh, cube, oh, delta, right? Delta to the power 1, delta to the power 3, delta to the power 5, and so on. So this is equal to 1 minus delta. Agree? I mean, this guy is exactly equal to the sum of those uh, terms. All I'm doing is just I'm grouping the odd number, odd um, I'm sorry, even power deltas here. And so this is delta to the power 0 and the odd power deltas there. So, so therefore, uh, the equality sh should still be the same. Well, this guy is actually, when I take it delta parentheses, equal to 1 plus delta, not cube, but square, plus delta 4, etc. Huh, so you know what? This term and this term are exactly the same thing. Well, how do I know? Because, I mean, well, this dot, 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 dot means you continue till the infinity. And the beauty of infinity is that it never stops. So therefore, this term will be equal to this term. So this is the term I would like to find, right? Call this x. So that basically means the following, uh, x plus delta x. So it's x plus delta x equals 1 divided by 1 minus delta. So this is x parenthesis 1 plus delta. So divide both sides by 1 plus delta, you're going to get x. So this is nothing but 1 divided by 1 minus delta, 1 plus delta. So 3 times this term. Okay, I cut the unnecessary uh, part. So... The no deviation payoff, uh, which is I play a tit for tat strategy, and the deviation payoff, uh, which means I, I'm going to play uh, defect and then stick to the tit for tat strategy. Remember, we already calculated those payoffs. All so I have to do just solve it. One minus alphas, uh, deltas, I'm sorry, will cancel out. So I'm going to have two plus two delta. I just do the cross product greater than or equal to three. 2 delta greater than or equal to 1, delta greater than or equal to 1 half. Next, uh, I'm going to look at this. Why CD or DC? Well, it doesn't matter, right? CD, DC is like here, player 1 is now player 2, and player 2 is now player 1. All right, so the roles will change. So let's start with this one. Uh, but why not DD? Well, you can, obviously, you can continue your analysis with DD. But the thing is, playing DD forever... Remember, DD is the only Nash equilibrium in this stage game, and repeating the Nash equilibrium always forms uh, a Nash equilibrium. So therefore, for any delta, uh, the, 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 the tit-for-tat strategies in those subgames uh, form a Nash equilibrium. All right, so you don't really need to make any analysis. Thanks to our uh, propositions, the results we already know from our previous analysis. Okay, so I'm going to look at this case. What does that mean? That means consider histories or subgames where I played C in the last period, T minus 1, and you played D. You, I mean the second player. 
All right, by the way, I want to, uh, I, I need some space. So I'm gonna say here, I need delta greater than or equal to one half, okay? All right, so now, once again, no deviation payoff. So player one, no deviation payoff means what? Uh, well, according to those, uh, the, the tit for tat strategies, I'm gonna start with D and then I'm gonna stick to my tit for tat strategy and you always stick to your tit for tat strategy. Well, what about deviation? So this is no deviation this time. Once again, why this is no deviation this time? Well, remember, this is a possible sub game where you played D. And so according to my tit for tat strategy, if I'm gonna to stick to it, I'm supposed to play D, all right? Well, deviation, however, means uh, I'm gonna de deviate in period T, and then for the rest of the game, I'm gonna to stick to my tit for tat strategy. Once again, I am using one deviation property. So if I don't play D, well, there's only one option I can play. I can play C and then stick to my uh, tit for tat strategy for the rest of the game. So this is a deviation uh, a payoff. All right, let's calculate them. We kind of did actually, uh, but I just want to do it again uh, in this new sub game. Well, I played D. What are you gonna play in period T? Well, because I played C in the previous period, you're supposed to play C, all right? So therefore the outcome is gonna be D, C in, in period T. So D, C means I'm gonna get three plus. What about next period? Well, remember I play what you played and you will play what I played. So it means uh, C, D will be the outcome. CD, it's zero times delta. So you got the idea, CD, DC, CD, DC. So the three delta square and so on. Well, do I need to make this calculation again? So this is three, one plus delta square plus delta to the power four, etc. Well, we just calculated it. It's equal to three divided by one minus delta, one plus delta. Well, what about this one? Um, well. I'm gonna play C, but what are you supposed to play? Well, remember I played C in the previous period, so you're, gonna, you're supposed to play C uh, according to your tit for tat strategy. So CC is gonna be the outcome in period T, which means uh, payoff two. Well, what about next period? Well, because I played C and you played C, we're gonna basically keep going playing CC forever. So it's two delta, two delta square, and so on. So it's equal to two divided by one minus delta. We, we calculated exactly those payoffs uh, uh, for this case, remember? But the thing is, the sign of the inequality is gonna be different. Why? Well, because if tit for tat strategies form subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, this payoff must be greater than or equal to this payoff, which means three divided by I mean, no deviation payoff should always be greater than or equal to deviation payoff if you want to show that something is SPNE. So one minus deltas will cancel out. If you solve this, you're going to show that delta is, uh, I'm sorry, well, let's solve it. I don't want to. So this is three less than or equal to uh, two plus two delta. So I send two to the other side. That means, and divide both sides by two, delta is less than or equal to one half. Oh my goodness, what's happening? Well, what's happening is the following. In, for sub games where we played CC in the previous period, uh, the tit for tat strategies form a sub game perfect Nash equilibrium if uh, delta is high enough. Specifically, delta is greater than or equal to one half. However, in some sub games, where we played CD, uh, well, the, again, the same tit for tat strategies can form Nash equilibrium if this delta is actually low enough. In particular, it's less than or equal to one half. So you know what? There's only one delta value which is gonna satisfy both of those conditions, which is delta equals one half. 
What does that mean? That means if delta is different than one health, it's the, the tit for tat strategies are not going to be Nash equilibrium in one of those subgames. Remember the definition of subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Your continuation strategies must be, must be forming Nash equilibrium at every subgame. So this is possible only if delta is equal to one health. Uh, you can say, by the way, uh, we didn't check this case. Uh, you can. Uh, actually, you're going to get exactly the same thing. Uh, so basically, I can conclude, therefore, that there's only one delta value where the tit for tat strategies are going to form subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. But you know what? This delta is, I mean, delta equals one half. What is special about it? Nothing. Uh, tit for tat strategies do not form subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Yes, there's just one specific value where they are SP and E, but this specific value it has no, I mean, valid, uh, 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 I mean, there's no point of sort of insisting that the players are going to have delta equals one half. Uh, so therefore, conclusion, the tit for tat strategies can not be subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. I hope that was clear.